So first of all, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure. I'm, I, I'm absolutely fascinated by your books, uh, Don't Think an Elephant in the Political Mind, uh, especially the way that they relate to uh, the, the way that the Bush administration and those on the, uh, w within the, the conservative movement or, or more right-wing movement in the United States were able to, to latch on to the power of metaphor. Uh, maybe you can explain for us why framing is so important when it comes to developing messages that you want to deliver to your audience? Well, the first thing to understand is a little bit about how the brain works and how reason works. Uh, we grew up with uh, an old theory of reason coming from the 17th century, uh, and it assumed that all reason was conscious and that you, it fit the world directly and therefore uh, and that everybody reasoned uh, via logic that being rational meant being logical and therefore uh, if you just told people the truth they would reason to the right conclusion and the assumption behind that was that words just fit the world directly that uh, they that's how they worked uh, we've since uh, discovered that that isn't true uh, and the reason is a very simple one we think with our brains now what we've discovered is that the way we really think is in terms of what are called frames and conceptual metaphors and cultural narratives. Now, let me try to give you a sense of what it means to just think that way. Every thought we have is in those terms, and every word is defined in terms of frames and met metaphors and cultural narratives. You can't say any word at all without those things. So framing is not unusual, it is the normal way we think. And uh, each frame is physically there in a neural circuit in your brain. You learn these frames as you're growing up in a culture. Now, what is particularly important has to do with metaphorical thought. People used to think that metaphor was in language and that, uh, y you know, that it had nothing to do with real meaning. But it's quite the opposite. Metaphor is constitutive of meaning. And uh, for example, if, I, if you say prices rose, that means they didn't physically go up, but you understand that more is up and less is down. And it's not just here, it's around the world. Uh, if you uh, think in terms of a warm person or a cold person, that's metaphor, but it's a normal metaphor that occurs naturally. Now, what's interesting is that because we have the brains we have, we naturally think in terms of metaphor. So, so when you choose the right word that taps into one of those metaphors that guides your life, uh, is it fair to say that in essence you're a s accelerating the effectiveness of the message because that, that internal cultural narrative plays out in the mind of the listener? That's right. When you use the word tax relief, you are uh, supporting, you are strengthening conservative frames. You're, conser you're strengthening conservative moral system in the brains of the listeners, just using the word. And even the word taxes have be has become an, an, a conservative word. So that when you just talk about raising taxes or cutting taxes, what you're doing is uh, helping conservatives. You're activating co a conservative view of the world. You know, whereas taxes from a progressive point of view are what you pay to have a government that protects and empowers you. Protects not only in terms of police and military protection, but environmental protection, worker protection, safety nets, and so on, health care, and uh, empowers you in ways that people usually don't talk about. Uh, President Barack Obama, during his campaign, used the slogan, yes, we can. Like, I interpret that to be a positive, inclusive uh, statement about accomplishment. And, and in using that statement, was he basically reframing the, the sandbox that John McCain had to play in? Here's what's important about yes, we can. First, what went before in the previous three or four sentences? In each of those sentences, what Obama was doing was talking about protection and empowerment of people and empathy. That's what that was about. And then when people said, yes, we can, they were saying, yes, we can do that. But there's another thing that that was doing. We have in our brains two different emotional pathways. 
one for positive emotions with dopamine as a neurotransmitter, one for negative emotions with norepinephrine as a neurotransmitter. And what's important is, yes, we can activate the positive pathways. It activates the positive emotions. That's really important, whereas fear is one of the negative emotions. Hmm. So today, General Motors, 39 days after going into bankruptcy, is, has emerged from bankruptcy. But over the last few weeks, I don't know if you've noticed, they've been running a, a campaign where they say, uh, we're about reinvention. And in doing so, I can't help but believe that they're reframing the way that we think about General Motors under kind of the, the, the morality guise of, of redemption. Would that be a correct assessment from your perspective? I think that's exactly right. Uh, what General Motors is doing is activating a redemption frame that we have. That is, you've done something wrong, you've admitted that it's wrong, from now on you're going to be doing exactly the right thing. And that is something that's believable if you have a redemption frame in your brain. That's exactly what they're trying to do. And so therefore, the cultural narrative that plays out in the mind of the listener is far more eloquent than if you were to try and articulate all the reasons why you should now believe in General Motors again. Exactly. You know, it is not just giving the rational reasons that matters here. It's what is evoked in the brain. The rational re reasons might happen to evoke the right cultural narrative and the narrative of redemption, but a simple word can do it more efficiently. And moreover, it can do it unconsciously. And this is important. Most of our thought, about 98%, is unconscious. We're not aware of it. And therefore, it's more effective because you can't challenge what's unconscious. When it's not happening consciously, it, it, it will also affect uh, those people that we, that we have in our society as watchdogs, reporters as well, and it will affect them in an unconscious manner as well, will it not? Absolutely right. Reporters are trained in graduate schools of journalism uh, in such a way as to not notice all of what we're talking about. They are trained in what is called the rational model of thought, which says that all thought is conscious, that words are neutral, that they can just use a popular word and it won't and that will not be uh, prejudicial in any way. They're not trained in terms of how the brain works in terms of framing. Usually reporters who are trying to be neutral don't notice when they're using conservative frames simply by using words that make sense in terms of conservative frames because they activate those frames. So you'll find reporters, even the front page of the New York Times, will talk about tax relief uh, very normally as if it were a neutral idea when it's not a neutral idea. It's fascinating work. Um, I guess it has tremendous benefit to anybody who is in a position where they need to communicate as effectively as possible in a world that is giving uh, a shorter and shorter amount of their attention to any particular message. Well, it's not merely communicating. It has to do with how you understand your political life and your social life and your economic life. It's understanding that is at issue, not just communicating. This is not about spin, though you can use it for spin. This is mainly about how you truly understand the world. What people don't understand is that you don't get facts in themselves without framing. In order to understand a fact, it must be framed. It must make sense. If I give you some numbers, those numbers must mean something, and they can only mean something through a system of framing. In order to say what you really believe, you have to frame it properly. If you try to say something neutral, using words you think are neutral, but have actually been conservative words, then you're going to frame it in conservative terms without knowing it. This takes work, doesn't it? It's not something that just pops into your mind. Boy, does it ever take work. Uh, there's a reason. I've now written five books on this, but uh, the political mind sort of surveys most of it. It really requires understanding what understanding itself is. 
Uh, it's not something that someone can just read a book and then sit down and do. It takes some expertise. Um, we train PhDs in doing this, and there's a reason why they have to get PhDs. Uh, people who just uh, take one course can learn lots, but it really takes doing and understanding. It is not simple. A lot of advertising executives seem to be relatively good at that. They seem to be able to reduce things down to just a, a couple of different uh, words, like what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. To me, taps into many of, uh, of, of the metaphors that guide our life as well. That's right. But that um, ability takes training. Those ad agents, agency folks put in years of work to learn how to do that. Some people have very good instincts about it and can do it very quickly, but others take time. Moreover, that slogan, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, was the basis of a lot of actual focus group research where they found out that the reason people went to Vegas was to get away from constraints on their everyday lives and they didn't want what happened there to get back into their everyday lives. It's fascinating, isn't it? Well, thank you very much for your time and, uh, and, and for the wonderful books that you've produced. I really appreciate it. Really a pleasure to be here and, uh, and to talk. Take care.